My name is Ben Stricker, and I'd like to introduce you to someone special. Here are some words to describe this person. Pretty, helpful, exciting, trustworthy, loving, and lots of hugs. She's a great cook and helps us when we are sick. She's funny and knows how to cheer us up when we are sad. She puts all of us before herself, helping us even when she is tired and doesn't have any more time. The special person is my mom, Michelle Stricker, and she is here to tell you all about how to love the person God created you to be. Please clap real loud for Michelle Stricker! Wow, that was quite an introduction. I did not know that was going to happen wherever Beth is. <laughs> oh gosh, okay. Can we pull it together here? So that was my sweet Ben, and that's kind of funny because last night the kids said to me, um, I have two at home, everybody else is off doing other things. Um, but my Ben and Izzy, who are twins, said, Mom, why don't you practice your, what you're going to say in front of us? And I usually do not do that. I don't speak in front of people. But I said, well, sure, why not? So they pulled their chairs out quick. And they sat down. And I started in talking. And they were both very mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, attentive. And my son, Ben, starts going <gasps> literally, like seven times. This is a 15-minute talk, seven times, looking at the clock at the clock. I finish and Izzy immediately says to me, oh mom, I learned so much. And I'm like, oh, that's good, that's good. And Ben, my Ben says, well mom, I think that's more geared towards women. That really doesn't affect me at all, but you did a good job. So that was super cute, super cute. All right, so I am here tonight. I am Michelle Stricker and I'm excited to be here tonight and um, an evening that Beth has planned and her team has put together. It's been uh, just a lot of fun this evening. <clears throat> so the topic that I was asked to speak on when Beth called me back in late spring um, and she said, Michelle, are you going to be here in June? We're going to do an event, <clears throat> excuse me, called Rooted. And would you please speak on um, how to love who God made you to be? And I said, well, Beth, let me check my calendar. Let me pray about it and I'll get back to you. And I literally hung up the phone and God didn't speak to me audibly, but he said, Michelle, you and I have wrestled over the years with this. For sure, you're going to speak on this tonight. So this is something that I have um, worked through with you over and over throughout the years. So hopefully I will shed something um, of light to you ladies as well and some nuggets about that. So when I was preparing for this topic, I thought, who, how do I love who God made me to be? And sometimes I think that when we're young, when we're we, middle school years or what I call junior high, I grew up in Ohio, we called it junior high, we start to look at the girls beside us. And that kind of starts to define who we are, at least physically, right? So I'm kind of going to start off by what I'm not going to be talking about tonight, kind of odd, um, but how it plants those seeds about how we look to ourselves. So what I'm going to put up, not yet, Deb, is a picture of me in junior high. And I have to tell you, you know, you come back from summer and you look at your best friend, Beth, and she's got a matching outfit for picture day. She's got earrings and a necklace that her mom bought, beautiful hair. And you're like, wow, Beth, what happened to you over the summer? Or even my friend, Laura, she had long blonde hair and blue eyes. And I was like, wow, you, you look really good. And so entering my seventh year, <clears throat> my seventh grade, this is the class picture of what I look like in seventh grade. So I give you permission to laugh, but no taking pictures. So go ahead and put up a, Lord have mercy, right? I mean, I even wrote at the top, I took a bad picture. I mean, my mom, I, I do not think my mom, bless her heart, even looked at me before I walked out the door. So I made a mental note of that to myself, my big old glasses too. And, and I told Beth, no pastor will see this before the talk on Wednesday, <laughs> right over there, Pelzer, um, so that they can't use it against me. But that starts to define who we are when we start to look kind of beside us. Um, and I'd like to say that things got better in eighth grade, and I'll share this really quick. Um, but I remembered this because you go to your grandma's house and bless you grandmas, right? You put the picture up because you're like, you are so beautiful. This is my granddaughter. And I'd be like, oh my gosh. I'd go to her work and she'd have my picture, a little picture on her desk. I'm like, oh, take it down, take it down. So for eighth grade, I made a metal note with my mom. I said, mom, this is when perms were big. I grew up in the late 70s. 
I said, Mom, I really want to get a perm. All my friends are getting perms, and I want to have a matching outfit too, Mom, because I want to look really snazzy for pic class pictures that take place, let me just say, in September, right, for class pictures. So this was me in eighth grade. Next one, Tim. It did not get better. <laughs> Who buys their daughter a suit in eighth grade? I had matching pants, a turtleneck, and permed hair. And, but the big glasses, so I, it, it was just a hot mess. So anyways, that, okay, you can take that down. See why I didn't want the pastors to see this. So anyways, that starts to define us, then we start to look beside us of who we are. And as we grow and we mature into uh, women and into godly women, as it were, we start to see how God has, what I'm going to talk about tonight, has hardwired us. So we are, uh, each of us are hardwired differently. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to have us look at Psalm 139, verse 13. And it's a Bible verse that you girls know really well. I'm going to ask you to um, listen to it with fresh ears. I'm going to read it, so if you don't have it, I will read it. We're going to look at Psalm 139, 13 through 16. I'm going to touch on 13 and 15, and then I'll circle back at the end with 14 um, and 16. Fresh ears, girls, fresh ears. It says, I better look here. Oh, hold up. I got, I'm old enough. I need readers. Psalm 139, 13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. So when we listen to that, girls, with fresh ears, we hear how God has knit you together so not only physically, right, with your bone, your hair color, and your eyes, but he has also knit you together with your personality and how he has hardwired you. He has been purposeful and intentful about that. Um, and he talks about weaving together. So all of you ladies who are knitters out there, you know that everything is done methodically and perfectly, and it lines up beautifully, and that is what God has done to, for you, for each one of us, when he has hardwired us. So when we talk about being hardwired, we say, well, what is that? And so I'm going to list a couple things, and when I start saying them, I want your mind to drift a little bit, not a whole lot so that I lose you. But when I start listing different gifts, and there's a ton of different gifts out there, girls, but we're just, I'm just giving you a rough couple few. I want your mind to drift to say, oh, yeah, I know who has that gift. I know who's wired that way. So if some of us have musical talent, like right over here, right? Or my daughter, Sarah, you, you may have seen sing up front at church sometimes. She is gifted musically. I am not, for sure. There are some of you who can juggle a million different projects at work in the office or in the home with all the kids. There are some of you that have a designing, that artistic, that creativity gift, right? There are some of you that have um, leadership skills, for instance, with Beth and her leadership team for pulling this all together, all the different aspects. Some of you uh, work in children's ministry um, and youth ministry and things like that. So you are wired that way. Some of you are good with numbers. So I know that there are women that have come to mind when I speak about each one of those. So hold that thought and we'll circle back to that as well. So I'm gonna break it down into quick um, three little snapshots or seeds, if you will, tonight, uh, um, and try not to run over time. So the first one is God, I had said that God equips you uniquely um, for his purposes. And you may say, how do I know, Michelle? How do I know how I'm equipped? When I was in my um, young married life, I remember Tom would come home, and I'd ha I have two little, so I have four children all, total, but my oldest and my youngest are separated by two years at that time. And I would say to Tom, I do not know how I'm wired. I literally just make it through the day, honey. Everybody that was alive in the morning is now alive at night, and I'm tired, and I have nothing else. I don't think that God hardwired me at all. In fact, I would, I would joke about this. I would say, God, I think, I, Tom, I think that when God was hardwiring people, you know, and being woven together in the secret place, I stepped out of line and went and got a Diet Coke or something because I don't feel it, right? I mean, I think we've all been there at some point. He was so encouraging and puts up with so much. Um, but here's my challenge for you. 
If you do not know how you are hardwired, here's three things for you. First one you're going to know before I even get it out of my mouth. Be in the Word. I think Joan and Helen are going to talk about that tonight, about what being in the Word means. Ask God. Ask Him to reveal that in you. Give Him Say, give me some opportunities, God, to test that out. Um, I want to know how I'm hardwired. And journal it out. And He will be faithful and obedient to answering that. I promise, promise you, girls. The second thing is... Um, there are different tests that you can take. Tom and I took um, this many years ago. It's called Strength Finders. Um, ours is 2.0. They may have some older ones out there. It's a quick online test um, that asks you questions pretty succinctly. And then at the end, it spits out um, kind of like how you're hardwired. And it lists your five top strengths is what they call it. And they really are pretty spot on. And it gives you ideas on how to use that. Again, that's a secular test, but it's, it's really good. And number three, if you don't know how you're hardwired, you need to ask a girlfriend, ask your spouse, your mom, a coworker, somebody that will lovingly be, um, tell you the truth. You do not want to ask your yes girlfriend, right? The girlfriend that said, can I sing? Oh, yeah, you can sh for sure sing, right? I mean, you think about those people on American Idol, and the mom's like, oh, you're such a good singer. Wait till they hear him. He's so good. And you're like, how did this person even, who let them through? What mom did not tell them? So you want to ask that person, how do you see me hardwired? Because a lot of times we can see it in our girlfriends, in our neighbors, in our sisters, we can say, you are in your sweet spot, you are in your wheelhouse, I can know it so well. So that you wanna ask them. And sometimes, we know how we're hardwired, and we say, hmm, really don't like how I'm hardwired. I kinda like her gift, I like how she's hardwired, or I like her gift, she's really doing something um, for Christ out there. She's really at the forefront. And I challenge you girls, and this is going to lead into our second, uh, my second note, is when we start to do that, kind of like I did with the whole 7th, 8th grade picture, we start to take our eyes off God and what he's called us to do, how he's hardwired wired us, and we say, I'm coveting hers. I'm coveting her gifts. I don't like how I've been hardwired. And our focus has changed from here to here, to our sides. So... That's going to lead us into our second point. We become, um, I, call, I call many things, a battlefield. And we enter that, and that battlefield can be discontentment with our gifts and our talents, the way things are. It can trigger us to have low self-esteem when we start to measure up by the girl beside us, right? Um, it can be um, our self-worth starts to deteriorate, all because our eyes are no longer here but they've come to the sides, right, girls? So how, um, how do we get there? I'll tell you a quick story. There was a woman in uh, my oldest daughter and my youngest, and she had a kid in my oldest daughter, Jessica, who's at Cedarville, she's 20, who's actually out right now up in the uh, Boundary Waters, haven't had any contact with my husband or her because they're doing this bonding thing. And I'm hoping that they're not eaten by bears or anything because there's no self-service, there's no nothing. I'm a warrior and a planner. I'm like, you've got to plan for all these things, Tom. He's like, we'll be fine. Anyway, so my daughter, I digress, sorry. So my daughter and my, my Sarah, there was a mom that had two kids that lined up in the same class. And so our lives crossed constantly in school. This woman was gifted in so many areas. She was a helper to all the teachers, even teachers that her kids weren't even in class with because the teachers knew that she had great leadership skills. She's the kind of mom, and you guys are all going to go like, mm-hmm, know that mom, who would sign up uh, you know, for the, the classroom party, and she would say, well, I'll bring snack. And you're like, oh, of course you will. And it would be beautiful, this beautiful snack for third graders. Or she'd like, I'll do the craft. And you're like, okay, here we go. She's doing it's going to be amazing. And it was amazing. They're like keeper crafts, you know, not the kind you put in the basement. And even the games, I mean, she came up with great games and had little prizes for the kids where I was like, oh, my gosh, I got a month and I got to figure out what to do for the Valentine party. I'm so stressed out. So clearly not in my wheelhouse, clearly not in my gifts and talents, but it was in hers. And, and, the, and the best part for her, well, 
for her. She was cute all the time. So watch my vision, right? Watch my vision, girls. So I went from here to here. She was cute. And even better, she was the nicest person, genuinely nice. So you couldn't be like, oh, I'm so jealous of her, don't like her. You were like, oh, I love her, love her, and I'm so jealous of her. My self-worth is not right as good as hers. So you can see that I give you that story because clearly my vision at that time went from here, God, what do you ever you want me to do at this elementary school? I will be your hands and feet. I will do what you have called me to do with the gifts and talents that you've equipped me with. And instead, I was using her as my measuring stick, right? My focus went off. And so um, that affects everything. I begin to compare myself to her. So what happens when we take our eyes off of our designer, our creator, and we're in that battlefield? And this is where I think some of my youth, the girls when I was in youth ministry will remember. Happy devil act. Um, and my kids use this as, I use this for my kids at home right now. Um, and I am a visual kind of girl. I pray visually. I just, I learn visually. That's how I'm wired, right? hardwired. And I call it the name it and claim it. Name it and claim it. So you name it. What is happening? And this is how it goes, girls. So hopefully um, somebody will be like, oh, I like that. I name it. God, my eye. And you have to be honest with God. He already knows, right? So you can't be saying, God, I'm just, I'm not as good as she is. Would you please make opportunities for me to be just as good as this and serve you in this school? Pull that layer back, girls, and get honest. Say, God, my eyes have gone off of you, and I am using her as my measuring stick. I am using whatever it is as my measuring stick for what I consider valuable for your kingdom, for how you've hardwired me. I don't like the gift you've given me. I feel like that it's not the right one, and I am sorry, God. I am coveting other people's gifts. I'm not seeing the gifts that you have given me as worthy, and I am so sorry, God. And that is getting right down to the core of it. Girls, there's no messing around. And so then I say, I claim it. And again, I think that Helen and Joan will touch on this. When you stand in the word of God, ladies, it is powerful. And so you will claim it. And I have done this through different things throughout my life, through hard times, through death. I claim the scriptures, and that's where it's important. God doesn't care if you say, well, I don't know where it's at in the Psalms, the Psalm whatever. God says, you just claim my scripture, girls. I know where it's at. And this is how you do it. We're going back to 139, Psalm 139, uh, 15. For you created my inmost being. God, you created me from the beginning on the inside. My spirit, God, not only did you create my form, my hair, my eyes, you hardwired me. You knit me together, Lord. That is methodically, that is meticulously. There is no willy-nilly in that, God, in my mother's womb. Here's 14. I may not believe it right now, God. I may be running on my emotions, and I know that's not what you want me to run on, but on wisdom. And it says in your words that I will praise you despite how I feel, that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, period. And I stake my claim on that. That kind of puts your self-esteem, all of those feelings of self-worth, the feelings of I don't know how I'm hardwired in the back. My frame was not hidden from you, God. I am never out of your sight. I never was and I never will be when I was made in that secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. You have seen me, God, from beginning to end and you know me um, inside and out. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. He has a plan, girls, for each one of us, right? You have a plan for me, God. You have a purpose for me. You have a purpose for me to do your will with the gifts and talents that you have given me, God, for your kingdom, for your glory, not for mine, not that people can say, oh, she did a great job, snacks or whatever, for your glory, for your purposes, um, and I lay claim to that. So that is quickly how I do the name it, claim it, and claim scripture, and that it's powerful. So I'm going to leave you with three different challenges. Um, and these are not overnight things, girls, right? Because I think that, you know, I was young um, in my married life, and I told you I didn't have a clue how I was wired. I was just overwhelmed. 
And then you say, well, here, I feel like I'm in my sweet spot, God. And then God kind of churns things up a little. And you're like, well, now I don't know what my sweet spot is anymore. So these are not overnight things. But number one, if you don't know how you're hardwired by God, will you intentionally seek him? Will you call upon him to reveal himself to you in that? Ask your sweet sisters in Christ, not the yes girls, the girls that are going to be truthful in love. Number two, will you try that name it, claim it? Will you be honest with God? Will you be able to say, God, my eyes are off of you. My eyes are off of you and onto someone else for my measuring stick. And the lastly then, when you know how you are hardwired, um, how God's perfectly hardwired for you, wired you, will you rest in that? Will you be able to love yourself in that so that you can um, be fruitful for his kingdom, fruitful for his glory. Because girls, how much sweeter is it when we can link arms side by side with each of our different gifts and talents and say, God, we are game on. We are all on the same page for your glory. When we're linked arms and we're looking for God and we're not looking to the right or to the left, right? And feeling um, inadequate. So those are my challenges for you tonight. Hi there. It's been joked about forever that no one works harder than a mother. Mothers hold honorary degrees in medicine, biology, hospitality, counseling, education, management, as well as many other fields. While many jokes are made in jest, there's always a root of truth. This could not be more true of my mom. She managed to bring up five children in a godly household with the audacity to make it look easy. Yet now as a parent, I know it was with great effort and intention that this allowed her to be the example she is. She is a constant encouragement and a wealth of knowledge. Her wisdom and experience are something I value every single day. You won't want to miss a word. I am proud to introduce your next speaker, Helen Felker. That was my oldest, Randy. They didn't tell us they were going to be doing that, so now I was sitting there trying to think, Oh, I wonder which, who's going to do it. <laughs> the funny thing is, I thought I was number three. I didn't know I was number two. So <laughs> here we go. My name is Helen Felker. Um, my sweetheart is Jim. He's my delight. And uh, as Randy said, we have five children. But really, we have nine. I have four more God gave us by marriage. So I'm very, very blessed. We have eight, almost nine grandchildren. All are girls but one. So... We have lots of pink going around, too. Um, I'm going to be 58 years old. I came to know the Lord when I was nine. And um, when Beth asked me to share learning more of God at any age, oh, this was tailored for me. It's so neat to see how the Lord knows what he's doing. Um, I have a passion for God's word. And I have a passion for studying God's Word. And then, uh, for those of you who know me, I am always compelled to share something with you then um, from God's Word. But it truly delights me. But it wasn't always that way. It is something that developed um, over time. And like I said, I came to know the Lord when I was nine years old. And uh, my mother had known the Lord but was very silent. And so I came running home from this little Bible club next door, and I'm telling my mother that what had happened, and she kind of looked at me and thought, oh, my. And it wasn't long after that that the rest of my family, over a period of time, we all became believers. And it was important to my mother that I be taught. And so it started from the age of nine that God put people in my life, year after year, season after season, who taught me. And as I was learning, my passion for God's word began to grow. Um, and I just have to throw this out here. Joan Drought was my first Bible study teacher. <laughs> it's just so appropriate that she's up here tonight with us because um, she's one of the ones that really, really, truly, as a young woman, uh, she awakened my love um, for the word of God. And I just, the, the years that we spent together, and um, God used you to change my life my sweet friend. He really did. Um, this past semester in Bible study, I learned so much. And one of the things I learned, 
about this beautiful, beautiful book, The Word of God, is how this really is God's message to us. And for so many years, I kept trying to find, you know, I was looking at the history of mankind, how God interacted with, the, with man, and my perspective, even though I knew him, and even though I had been studying it, was what this Bible was for me. And what I have learned is this Bible is, it's not man's story. This is God's story that he has laid out for every single one of us. This is his way of showing us who he is, what he's like, how he loves us, how he wants us to live. It's all about God, ladies. This book is all about God and the work that he did through his son, Jesus Christ, and then that beautiful Holy Spirit that he has given us. That's what this book is about. So as Michelle said, I have to take you back to God's word to be totally rooted. This is where it's at, and it starts early. But I'm kind of like Michelle. I have my three little points here. My first point is, how do you even begin this learning about God? You may be a new believer. You may be a new grandma, new mommy. You may be somebody who's looking at the other end of life, and heaven is sweeter by the day. But wherever you are, you're never too old to learn about God. You're never too old to go into his word. But how do you start? And I just want to encourage you with my first point. You need to seek the Lord. Go to him in prayer and share your heart. And Michelle talked about this too. Just lay yourself before the Lord and say, I want to figure this out. I, I want you to teach me. I want to learn. There's a verse, two verses in Psalm 42. It's just the first couple verses. It says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? I want us to be women who thirst. I want us to thirst for the things of the Lord. I want to always hunger for the things of God. No matter how old I am, it makes no difference. Seek God. Pray Ask him to show you. Number two, another S. I love SSS. Number two, surround yourself with people who are learners. Surround yourself with people who want to study God's word, want to learn more about him. And I'm going to make a huge plug for women's Bible study. Ladies, we have here, oh, we've got, the, we got a great setup. And we've got so many different days and so many different times. And like I said, Mine started, oh, I think 36 years ago, 35 years ago, in Joan Drought's living room. Having somebody sit down with us and say, I know your lives are busy. I know you're figuring out how to be married. You're figuring out how to be new mommies. Some of you have moved here from far away. You're trying to figure out how to live in Wisconsin. I know your platter is full, but you have to make time for God's word. Make time for God's word. It's not always easy, but make time for God's word. When you surround your people, surround yourself with people, not only does it encourage you, it gives you some accountability. There's something about going through something with another believer, another sister who loves the Lord. It's priceless. God meant for us to study his word together as well. So I encourage you to do that. My last point, S is for study. You need to, on your own, pick up your Bible, open it up all by yourself, and you need to begin to study. And for some, that is the most overwhelming thing in the world. How do you even know where to begin? What do I do? I don't even know where to start. And there's so many different philosophies on this. But another thing I learned last semester is, am I good? Another thing I learned last semester, there are so many different ways to study God's word, especially today's late, today, ladies. We have afforded to us things that our mom and dads never have. I am not computer friendly. I am, I am mocked openly. I, they, I know they do it, and I'm okay with it now. I'm okay with it because I go to them for help, and they're all laughing over there. But I was with a group of women, and I have to say, one of the ones that inspired me the most was my mom, Nina. And here she is, everybody, Oma, 
And Oma will not be ashamed when I tell you, Oma is 85 years old. And she sat there with her little notebook, and she put some of us to shame as she is clicking around on that thing. <laughs> you know, Helen, here's a Jewish translation. I'm like, oh, I keep trying to be Jewish, and I love the translation. <laughs> anyway, I'm working on it. Those of you who studied with me, Blue Letter Bible. Oh, they translate God's word. At, oh, I can't even tell you. Um, we have today so many beautiful things that we can use to study God's Word. We have Him and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We have each other. We have God's Word. Not everybody has had that. And I just want to close, and those of you, those of you who know me, it's like beating the drum. A few years ago, Mom was talking to me, and she said, you know, I got a new Bible. And I think you might like it. And so she lends me her Bible, and, and I look at it. And um, I may have even set it on the table for a while. And then I gave it back to her and decided I'd order one. So I ordered one and that, let that sit on the table for a while. And finally, I started reading this Bible that Mom had talked about. It's a chronological Bible. And I am a history major. I love history. I love order. I like it to make sense. And I always struggled with, like, well, you know, I mean, I know God put the book of Joel in there, but what's it all about? And what about the book of Habakkuk? What about, uh, the, all, I go through the book of Acts, and I think of all these different letters that were written. How does all that work? How does it come together? For me, it was this chronological Bible. It changed God's word for me. It helped me to understand the story that God was telling about himself. And it made sense to me. And the things that you have to read many times because sometimes, like the books of Chronicles and Kings, they, it, it kind of dovetails one after the other. And you know, the things I have to read two or three times, I needed it because then it started to make sense to me. So this is the thing that worked for me. I encourage you to try and find the thing that works for you. Um, it's different for all of us, but you have to try. You have to step out and make the effort. Um, and in closing, not only do you have to try, you have to not give up. And through the years, um, when things are um, difficult or scary or confusing, I think sometimes as women we get so overwhelmed. And I don't know about you, but I am the fixer. I want to fix it. I want to, and if I can't fix it, I'm going to make my husband fix it. Because that's what we do. And I want it to happen quickly. And sometimes this gets set aside because I'm so busy trying to fix something. But ultimately, when you are rooted in God's word, that's how we get to know him. That's how he affects our lives. And then, you begin to feel your cup fill up. And it just keeps filling, and it fills, and it fills. And then it starts to spill over. And to me, that's been one of the greatest blessings of studying God's Word, is my passion for it is so huge, I, can, I cannot really go a day without going into God's Word. I don't say that to you to boast. I say that is God has worked a work in me. And I know there are some of you out there that totally understand this. I've got to have a bit of this in my soul to go through my day. I just have to have it. And I have longed for that for so many years. I wanted to be one of those women, like the ones that were teaching me, who kept saying this and that. And I kept thinking, I don't know, I don't know how you do it. And I'm blessed to be at the season of life that I'm in because God has allowed that for me. Time now to be in his word and then brings these lovely ladies to me and let's, let's, let's me drip on them. And I just, I just love it. So I want to encourage you, seek the Lord, surround yourself with people who want to learn, and study God's word for yourself, ladies. Get in it and study it for yourself. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is Jackson Pelzer and I have the best mom in the whole wide world. Hi, my name is Andrew Pelzer, and I have the best mom in the whole world. 
No, I do. No, I do. No, I do. No, I do. <laughs> well, actually, we both have the same mom. Yep, that's right. My mom is the best because she loves our dad. And she loves to take care of all four of us each and every day. And that's not always easy. Our mom also is a really good friend. I think that is because she is a good listener. Yeah, she listens to us make a lot of noise all the time. It is important to be a good friend. One of the verses I learned in Iwana is a friend loves at all times. Tonight, our mom is going to talk about what it means to be a good friend. So grab a pencil. She has a lot of good things to say. I've heard her practice for the last three weeks. I love you, Mom. I'm proud of you, Mom. You'll do great. And when you come home, don't forget to give us a hug and a kiss. Please welcome our mom, Jamie Pelzer. <laughs> I walked out of the house to them arguing kind of like that. Um, they, I've been practicing for three weeks because um, this isn't my favorite thing to do and there's a lot of you. Um, so I'm going to just look over your heads. Have any of you ever received a call from a friend? You know, the one that makes your stomach leap into your throat and your knees go weak? When you finish your call, you sit there and you wonder through your tears how in the world you're going to be helpful for your friend. I've gotten these calls and I've wondered the same thing. So, how do we help our friends when they're hurting and they're in a tough spot? Well, I'm going to try and cover five biblical principles that, help us, that are going to help us give our friends the support that she needs and desires. So buckle up because five's a lot more than three and we're going to move fast. So first of all, I'm going to say something that I think should be obvious. If you're getting calls like this, it's probably coming from a friend with whom a good friendship has been established. Time and effort have been put into this friendship. In fact, meaningful friendships don't happen by chance. They happen by choice. We work hard to lay groundwork so that trust is there. We're engaged in this friendship. And like my son said, when Proverbs 17:17 17, 17 says a friend loves at all times, this is that friendship. Hard times are a chance to prove loyalty to our friends. We don't run and hide from the moment, but we address it like Jonathan did with David. Anybody recall the story of David and Jonathan? These men developed a friendship in their early teen years. They worked hard to establish a loyal friendship. But it gets a little bit more complicated when they become adults. You see, Jonathan's dad was King Saul. David had been anointed to be the next king of Israel. And there wasn't a whole lot about David that King Saul liked, and he decided that David's life wasn't useful anymore. In other words, King Saul is trying to kill his son Jonathan's best friend. Now here's where the loyalty part comes in for these guys. Jonathan risked his own life to save David's. In 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 4, Jonathan says to David, Whatever you want me to do, I will do for you. Are we willing to be that kind of a friend? Are we ready to show that kind of a loyalty in our friendships, especially when we receive the call from a friend? And if so, what are some tangible ways that we can do this? Obviously, you know your friends best, you're going to know what makes her tick, but here are just a few ways that you can reach out and help her. Give her a call. Text her, check in, see how she's doing. Write her an encouraging note. Those are my favorite, and I've received many of them. Make her a meal. Do her laundry. That's a way to get up close and personal. Clean her house. Take her out for a girl's night out where your only focus is to encourage and affirm her. Definitely let her know that you're praying. Could go on, but you kind of get the idea, right? Now next, I'm going to state something that I hope is already on your radar, but as Christian women, our most powerful resource is prayer. In the last part of James 5.16, it says, The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. We must be praying for our friends in their time of need, both on our own and if they're comfortable with it, Pray with them. 
We see the act of praying demonstrated over and over in Scripture. And I want to read you just one verse. Galatians 6, 2 says, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So since we see the command to pray for others repeated over and over, let's do it. This is our chance to take our friends' burdens before our Heavenly Father, and it's a huge privilege to be able to do that. Okay, so what in the world are we supposed to pray for? Well, to start with, probably the situation at hand. But some other suggestions would be, ask God to give your friend patience during this time. How about wisdom to make wise choices as she navigates through a hard road? Definitely pray for endurance for her. Neither of you know how long it's going to last, and she might need to endure for a while. Ask God to give her a calm heart and a clear mind in the midst of chaos. And don't forget, ladies, ask God to give you the wisdom to be the best friend that you can be. One thing that I had the privilege of doing um, as a friend went through a very hard time um, for several months was to write down the prayers that I was praying for her and for her family. And then she asked if she could have them to read and to share with her family members that don't know the Lord. I loved this idea, and I thoroughly enjoyed doing this for my friend. Um, unfortunately, the morning that I was going to give them to her, my sweet Adeline dumped her milk cup all over the notebook that I had been writing in, so my friend never got them. But the point was, she knew I was praying for her, and she loves Adeline to death. So. Now, this next one, I said we were going to go fast. This next one is a tad more difficult. At least it is for me. You need to be willing to confront your friend with truth. What if she finds herself in the middle of a mess because of a poor choice that she made? We have to be willing to confront her with her sin. And as much as I don't like confrontation, and you might not either, as women who strive to follow Christ and be obedient to his word, we're called to do this. In fact, I want to read two verses that talk specifically about this. Galatians 6.1 says, Brothers, and that doesn't excuse us, that's brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. How about this one? James 5.19 and 20 says, My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring him back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. These verses tell us clearly that when we are made aware of sin in another believer's life, we are to gently and humbly confront them. We are to speak the truth in love. This requires gentleness, a lot of humility, and a whole lot of soul searching before we confront our sister that's struggling. And as much as I hate confrontation, I've had to do this on a few occasions. I've found myself asking hard questions and pleading with friends to change their actions, to choose what's right, to move forward with integrity, and I wish I could say that it worked 100% of the time. Sometimes your friend will listen to you and sometimes she won't. But regardless of her response, we're called in scripture to do this. Okay, let's move on because thinking about confrontation makes me nervous and I'm already nervous enough to be up here. So next, we must be good listeners for our friends. Now let's be very honest with ourselves for a moment. We're all women in this room and women love to talk. It's really hard to be quiet and listen, but God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. We need to listen and then we need to listen again, and then if it's necessary, speak. Now I wanna look at an example from scripture about what this could look like, and I wanna look at the story of Job. But I wanna give you just a little bit of background before I read the passage. So Satan approached God one day and asked if he could test Job. Lucky guy. Now, God gave Satan permission to test him with one exception. Satan could not take Job's life, so Job loses all of his children to death. His wife is spared, but I'm going to be honest, she's not that helpful. He lost his livestock, and he had a lot. He lost all of his wealth, and he was a very wealthy man. 
Do you want to know what Job said when he lost all of this? In Job 1.21, in the second half of that verse, he says, The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. He refused to charge God with any wrongdoing. Well, when Satan sees this, he decides to take Job's health away from him as well. In fact, his health is so bad that his wife says, just curse God and die. Helpful, helpful lady. Now, it's here that I wanna jump in and read to you, and I'm gonna read to you from Job 2, 11 through 13, and we're gonna be introduced to Job's three friends, um, who I know don't have the greatest reputation, but they actually start off well, and that's where I wanna read to you. Um, and be kind, because these names are not your common everyday boy names. So, verse 11 in chapter two. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes, and they sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Did you catch that last part? At seven days and seven nights on the ground, and no one is talking to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Have any of you ever sat in silence for seven days and seven nights? Is silence hard for any of you? Personally, I love silence. In fact, I crave silence. I have four kids at home, and my house is never, ever quiet. But seven days of silence. I can be quiet. I don't know if I could remain quiet for that long when my friend is hurting. But I think we must be willing to sit still and just listen. I think we need to try hard to be a calm and quiet presence for our friend. I think we need to try our best to be available to be with her when she needs us. And I know that life happens, and especially with little ones, this can be hard. But do your best. Your friend knows you're trying, and she appreciates it. I think we need to be able to sit quietly and listen to her talk. Be there and quietly sit with her while she's crying. Be willing to listen to her yell if she needs to and just be compassionate. Don't try and solve her problem, which for those who are firstborns, this is really hard to do. But just listen to her and love her through your quiet presence and your listening ear. Okay, so we've talked about being a loyal friend. We've talked about praying. We've talked about being willing to confront if necessary, and we've talked about being a listener. This last one, I believe, is absolutely vital. When the time comes for us to speak, we must be very cautious. Are you able to keep a secret? Can you hold your tongue when you need to? I heard a very wise person say this recently. Breaking a confidence in critical times in a friend's life can be absolutely devastating. Let me read that to you again. Breaking a confidence in critical times in a friend's life can be absolutely devastating. Gossip is damaging to friendships at any time, but it can be absolutely devastating in the midst of a crisis. Will you allow me to read you just a few verses that talk about this? Proverbs 21, 23 says, he who guards his mouth and his tongue keeps himself from calamity. Proverbs 20, verse 19, a gossip betrays a confidence, so avoid a man who talks too much. Proverbs 11:13, a gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy man keeps a secret. Psalm 34:13 says, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. These verses are really clear, ladies. We need to be able to keep our mouths shut when it comes to our friends' tough, tough circumstances. In fact, unless they have specifically given you permission to share the details of the situation, it's not our job to talk about it or spread it. The tongue is a really small part of the body, as it says in James 3, but it has the ability to wreak havoc when we don't control it. And if this is a struggle for you, 
And let's be honest, it's a struggle for all of us at different points in our lives. The beautiful verse from Psalm that you could pray. Psalm 141.3 says this, Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over my lips. We want to be able to build our friends up in the midst of their difficult times, not break their trust in us by spreading something that they desperately didn't want spread around. Now, as we sit here tonight among friends, these words can be pretty easy to hear. But one day, you're probably going to find yourselves needing to apply these truths. And while I don't think of myself as an expert on this topic, I've had a little bit more experience than I guess I'd care to admit. I've been with friends who've been asking hard questions, and I haven't been able to give her the perfect answer, but I could quietly listen to her. I've sat with friends who are grieving, whether it's the loss of someone that they desperately loved or a dream that they really wanted to see come true. I've cried with them, and I've prayed with them, and I've prayed for them. I've confronted friends who have made immoral choices. And while none of these situations are easy, God has called us to be a good friend, especially in times of heartache and pain. I didn't do any of those perfectly, and my guess is when it's your turn, you're not going to either. But I do believe that scripture gives us so much guidance on how to love our friends, both when life is easy and especially when life is hard. We have the chance to maintain loyal friendships that will only deepen when you walk through tough times together. We can have the opportunity to pray with our friends and for our friends. We can do our best to humbly confront when the situation calls us to do so. And we can be the kind of friend who listens quietly. Our friends are going to treat us the way we treat them. And I guess I've lived enough life to know that one day, you and I are desperately going to need that friend to stand by us in our hardest moments as well. Thanks. The next speaker is a prayer warrior. She has wore out her knees in prayer. Ever since I can remember as a young boy, I would see her on her knees praying and reading her Bible. I don't think she's ever missed a day. She taught me that prayer and reading God's Word go hand in hand. In fact, we've never let her pray for Thanksgiving dinner because the food would be cold before she got done praying. I am proud to introduce my mother, Joan Drought. Remember, Mom, you only have 15 minutes. You ladies have been so blessed already. I am impressed by these women, these younger women, because I'm one of the roots around here. <laughs> I am just so impressed by the wisdom that they have and by the love that they have for God. It, I'm just praying it stirs your heart up like it stirred up mine. And I have to confess that these gals, <clears throat> excuse me, were so fluent because my brain is getting a little weak. I had to write my stuff down. I'm so afraid I'd forget something. And I wanted to tell you so much. And if I took the time, they'd go like this, and I'd have to leave. Anyway, I think of our theme, Rooted. What a great, great theme. Memorization and prayer. As I said, it's two great topics, but very hard to condense into 15 minutes. You ladies know both the subjects. To memorize is to hide God's word in your heart. Prayer is simply conversing with God. I read somewhere, this is a quote, God has fully equipped us to handle whatever comes our way. What we need is help in using the equipment, unquote. The equipment God has given us is the Bible, prayer, and the Holy Spirit. I want to share with you how he helped me use this equipment in my life. I remember the first Bible verse I ever memorized. It was before I was saved. I didn't even know it was from the Bible. It was on a billboard. We drive past there all the time when we go to the Milky Way custard stand. On it, it said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's all. I don't, they didn't have the complete verse. And if there was any scripture reference, I don't remember. But we went past it so often that I memorized it. And now I look back and I marvel. I think that even before I knew him, God was working in my heart to love his word 
and to memorize it, because he knew what he was going to do in my life. I was from an unsaved, unchurched family, and Jesus' name was only used in profanity. I didn't even have a Bible until I started dating Dan. Incidentally, that is the third Dan drought that has been at Garfield Baptist Spring Creek Church, and we have five that have been at this church totally from the beginning. So that excites me. Now I lost my place. <laughs> okay, here I was. Uh, I started dating Dan, and he took me to Garfield Baptist Church. I heard the gospel preach every Sunday. Pastor Coonley was here then. For over two years, I sat and heard that. And, you know, every time that an invitation was given to accept Christ, my heart would beat so hard, but I never responded. I knew about God. I knew that Jesus was his son, that he died on the cross, but I didn't have a personal relationship with him. About this time, this time of the month in July of 1954, after Dan and I had gotten engaged, we had a meeting with Pastor Cooling to talk about our wedding. That night he shared the gospel with me again, and I asked Jesus to forgive my sins to save me. That was the beginning of my roots. I was equipped with Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The roots started growing deeper. After we were married uh, a while, one Sunday, Pastor Cooley was speaking on the importance of being obedient in believer's baptism. He said, you can't expect your children to be any more obedient to the Lord than you are. Dan and I were both convicted immediately about the need of being baptized because I was pregnant at that time. He had been saved as a young boy, but he had never obeyed the Lord in water baptism, believer's baptism. <clears throat> Knowing that we would meet, am I doing this wrong? I don't know what I'm doing here. <clears throat> Knowing that we would meet with the deacons to confirm our faith, I started memorizing scripture verses because I got scared. I thought, oh, I don't know anything. What are they going to ask me? And so I can still remember lying in bed Nice way to go to bed at night, but I was memorizing Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Having these verses in my heart gave me the assurance of my salvation because you know what? This was God's word, and I knew God couldn't lie. Remember that poster? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I believed what he said. And as I became more rooted in the word, I realized the value of having it in my heart because you know, ladies, you don't have your Bible with you all the time. But when you have God's word hidden in your heart, it's there spontaneously as the Holy Spirit brings it. And you know, being the youngest in a family of four siblings and my parents, none of them being saved, having that word with me all the time and being able to share with them, knowing these verses on salvation, that it was not me saying it, but it's what the Bible said. That, that was a great thing, having it hidden in my heart. Um, one year I memorized a verse a week because I was doing a Bible study that challenged you to remember a verse. So that was 52 verses that year. Another time the church challenged the members to me uh, memorize a verse a week, which I did. And it's so great to have that Holy Spirit bring these verses to mind throughout the day when you need them. Like, Jamie, I think, just quoted this already, Proverbs 15, 1. Oh, no, she quoted another one. A soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. I have trouble with a sharp tongue, Jamie. And God would have to bring that verse to me often. And I have trouble with patience. Do any of you have trouble with patience? <laughs> wow, there are a lot of verses in patience, but the one that God always uses in my heart is, 
Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I hate that word, wait. And I have to wait. And another one, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And my two favorites that I learned, Philippians 4.13 and 4.19, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You know, when I memorized these verses so long ago, I didn't realize how much I'd need them the rest of my life, especially now that I'm a full-time caregiver for my husband. You have no idea, ladies, how the Lord has to bring these verses up to mind, and I cling to them all the time because you know what? They're true. God can't lie. I can believe them. All right, I'm lost again. Uh, and this, this is what I challenge you to do. These things didn't happen on my own. Just like I said way before, God spoke to my heart about memorizing, and it's the Lord that does it. And if you really want to memorize, you really want to learn, just ask him. Ask him to just give you the ability and the desire, and he'll do it if you really want it. And that brings us right to the second part. It was so hard to put memorization and prayer. I could talk to you for hours on this. But it leads to prayer. And I thought, who taught me to pray? I do not remember ever anyone in my family praying with me or teaching me how to pray. I think I can remember maybe at Thanksgiving they said, come Lord Jesus, be our guest. That, that's about all that was said. And as the years go by, I think I listen to others. I read the word. God commands us to pray throughout the Bible. Remember where it tells us Jesus got up early in the morning and he went to a solitary place to pray. We need to obey what God's word says. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, it tells us to rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. That means all the time. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. This is what he wants of us, to pray continually. And we can, we can do that. We're told to pray on all occasions. We do. We pray in church. We pray in our life groups. We pray at meetings like this. We pray for our meals. We pray at bedtime, whatever. It is so important for you to have a prayer partner of some kind. I encourage you to do that. I have so many wonderful prayer partners. And ask me later about them. I would love to tell you all about them, but I don't have time. But the prayer I want to focus on now is a very special time we might call our closet prayer. I challenge you to have a special place just for you and God to have fellowship, a special corner of the room, a special chair, a place where you and God can be alone and you can talk to him, talk to him out loud like you would a friend, a place where you meet with him regularly. It tells us in John, uh, James 5, 16b, it's the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Somebody quoted it in the, maybe the NIV, but I'm still back in the King James Version, and I like it when it says that the effectual, fervent prayer, it isn't like God bless my husband, God bless my children. Effectual, fervent prayer takes solitude. It takes hard work. You pour your heart out to God. In Psalm 62, 8, it says, trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your hearts before him. God is a refuge for us. Prayer like that is hard. Sometimes it's draining and emotionally and physically. And I brought this up because you know what this ladies, this is tissue is not strong enough for me. I have Viva paper towel. It's soft and it's very strong. And I cannot pray with my whole heart without crying. So every morning I got my, tissue, my Viva paper towel. <laughs> Most of you know the acronym for prayer, ACTS, A-C-T-S. 
adore, confess, thanks, supplication. When we adore him, we come to our Heavenly Father acknowledging who he is, naming his attributes, seeking his face, remembering his worthship, worth, W-O-R-T-H. What he is worth, that's what true worship is when we realize his worthship. I can remember when we had a ladies' prayer group sitting in a circle praying. I was a young Christian, and this lady would start out, and she'd start telling God all about himself, telling him how wonderful he was and that he was a savior and that he was a creator. And I thought, he knows all about that. What's she doing that for? Let's get to the request. <laughs> and then I learned, and then I grew in the Lord, and then I realized how important it was to just recite God's qualities. Then we come to confession. Confession, we must come to God with a clean heart. In Psalm 119, 23 and 24, it says, Search me, O God, know my heart, try me, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. It says in Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Do you want your prayers heard? Do you want God to hear? Do you want God to answer? We have to take time to search our heart. Praying isn't just talking. Praying is listening to God. It's a conversation, a two-way conversation. And when you come to this part in your prayer time, stop and listen and ask God to search your heart and convict you of any area that you need to confess to him. Because says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, after dwelling on his holiness, and when we come to the point of looking at our own selves, we see how far we are from his holiness and we realize we do need to confess. And if it were not for the blood of Jesus Christ, and we're clothed in that, we could not go to our Heavenly Father, our Holy God. Then we come to Thanksgiving. Oh, I like this time, because I have so much to thank him for. Thank him with a grateful heart, even with songs of praise. I am amazed the songs that God brings to heart to mine, songs that I learned maybe 20 years ago, songs that I taught kids in Good News Club, but songs of praise, and he just reminds me, and I think he just wants to hear them. And I, and I'm, I marvel, I know it's the Holy Spirit, because I think, I couldn't remember those songs, and there it was, and I'm singing songs of praise to him. Then uh, you get to the point where you can actually start your petitions. I challenge you, ladies, to have this prayer time regularly. Put him first in everything, and everything else will fall, will follow. I'm sorry. Put him first, and everything else will follow. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. This has become the greatest pleasure I have when I go to my prayer corner in my bedroom where I have my Bible, my devotion books, my pen, and my paper. It's a precious time. Now that my roots have grown deep over 62 years of knowing him, I don't do this because it's a command, or it's a discipline, or someone told me to do it. I do it because I crave the presence of my Heavenly Father, it's something I want to do, just like Helen says. She can't get by with having the, without having that word of God. Oh, boy, my time gets a little cut short with caregiving now, and I really get resentful that I can't spend that time in prayer the way I'd like to with God. But he understands. But it's so wonderful to go and meet with my Heavenly Father. And you know what? He delights in our coming to him. You know, when one of my children call me, I'm so happy to hear from them. Just like my son up there, that was so neat. Doesn't it bring you joy when your children want to be with you and to share their feelings or desires? Or they thank you for something that you've done for them, or they even compliment you about something that they think is nice about you. 
it, it brings you joy, doesn't it? And it's the same thing with our Heavenly Father. That's how it is with God. It brings him great joy when we eagerly and faithfully want to spend time fellowshiping with him in prayer, not just because for what he can do for us, but because of who he is, our gracious Heavenly Father, our Savior, the lover of our souls. Years ago, when I had a big responsibility in having a missions conference, and I put much prayer into it, and when it was over with, I realized God had answered every prayer. And he put these words into my heart and inspired them. And I call it our gracious God. I have a gracious God. He meets my every need. No, not just my need. He does what scripture says, gives exceeding abundantly. And I have this confidence when I ask within his will he hears my fervent cry and does graciously fulfill. What a joy it is to know him in this sweet relationship a father and a daughter in precious fellowship. Do I have time to pray? I can't see. Okay. Okay, let's pray, ladies. Oh, I want to take you to the throne, to the throne room of our Heavenly Father. And oh, our God, we come before you. Just awed at who you are. Awed by the fact that you are here with us tonight. Oh, Lord, we praise you. We glorify you. You have been so faithful. You are our loving Heavenly Father. My heart is just filled to the brim with what you have done in the hearts of these ladies. And all that has been said tonight, I praise you for that, my Father. We do realize, Father, that we are so unworthy to come into your holy presence. And yet you bid us to come. And so we ask you, Father, just cleanse us from all unworthiness, all sin, the sins we know about, the sins we aren't even aware of. Just wipe us clean. We want to be vessels, God, that can be used of you. And my prayer for each one of these ladies here today is that they would know you and believe you, that they would glorify you, that they'd be satisfied in you, and that they would experience your peace and enjoy your presence. Our dear Father, use everything that was said tonight for your honor and glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We're going to uh, have a little question and answer time. Maybe we could turn it down a little. But would you all thank these gracious ladies? So we don't want to keep you too late. We're going to just ask um, a handful of questions. Um, the first one is for Jamie. How, <laughs> how should you proceed with confronting your sister when she is a new believer or you are unsure of her spiritual beliefs? Okay, well, so Galatians 6 does tell us that we need to do this very gently and very, here we go, and very carefully. Um, but actually, Matthew 18 outlines it very clearly for us and we are told to just go and one-on-one -on -one talk with them about the issue at hand, um, and hopefully you get a good response. Then if you don't, it tells you to go with a few. Now this few, I don't think should be just anybody. I think you need to have a godly man or woman, let's go with women since we're all women here, um, a godly woman who is mature and understands this process, and you can go and talk with her. 
Then if that doesn't work, scripture tells us to get leadership from church involved. Um, we are very blessed here at Spring Creek and there are some godly men leading us. We have a godly women's director that I'm sure would be happy to help. And then if that doesn't work, ladies, it tells us to be done and to treat her as a pagan. And what that means is, unfortunately, you don't have contact with her anymore. If she is unrepentant and not willing to change, then it's time to move on, which is um, a really difficult thing to do. There's a whole lot of prayer <laughs> that goes into that and a whole lot of humility because um, you don't want to be so proud when you're going and you're confronting. You just, you want to do it very, very carefully and very gently. But Matthew 18 um, gives a very good description of how to do that. Thank you. Michelle. <laughs> so how do I figure out, um, how can I know how God made me to be? Well, I would go back again to those uh, three points that I briefly touched on. One was to be in the word, to be um, intentionally asking and seeking God um, for wisdom in that. The second one um, would be to uh, maybe that strengths finder book that I had mentioned that will give you your five top strengths. And then lastly, we can all see our gifts and the others are um, sweet sister's gifts. Um, and talent in their sweet spots, so I can guarantee that other women can see those in you. So ask a good, godly girlfriend that's willing to give you a straight answer. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, and Jamie, I just had a question. They didn't get your second verse from your third point. <laughs> <laughs> well, was Galatians you. six one? And do you remember My the other third point? Was con was confrontation? Um, so. That's not fair. That's not fair, is it? Girls, I was nervous. Um, it's Galatians 6, 2, I believe, that says, brothers, if you find someone in sin, gently go and confront them. The second one was James 5, 18 and 19. Thank you. Great note takers. Good. I appreciate the note taking because I think that's the references. Okay. Thanks. Um, Helen. How would you say the best place to start your personal Bible study is just to begin? And maybe you have a recommendation of a book to start with. That's a great question. Um, I think, and I'm going to go back to what I've learned this past semester. I, 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 almost, had to, I almost hesitate to give you a book. I want you to take your Bible. Um, there's something about going straight to God's word instead of going to a book about God's word. I feel very strongly about that. Um, I know that the women that I have talked to who are very fresh and just beginning, um, you may not know a lot about God's word. You may not know a lot about God himself and the great work of his son. And like many others, I will take you to the book of John. And it is just chucked full of so many treasures that I believe if you can just begin to read the book of John, and, um, and once you begin to read it, then you can pick up supplementary material that may help you um, to begin to understand. But I want you to go straight first to God's word. And another thing that's really easy to do is read the book of Proverbs one a day, ladies. It works out great when there's that 31 days in a month, so you don't even have to double up. And a proverb a day. Um, I, I think you can hardly go wrong. And I'm going to make another pitch for a while, ladies. If you're trying to figure this thing out and you want some guidance, it's right here. You don't have to go far. And um, it, it, it's a great way to learn how to study God's Word. But don't wait on that. God's Word, it, it speaks well for itself. So I would recommend you go straight to God's Word. Thank you. Joan, your memorization of scripture is wonderful. What kind of recommendations do you have for people on how to do it? Just wait a minute. There it is. 
how to do it. <laughs> I, I found it very helpful that when I read a verse, I like the verses that really apply to my heart and the testing or something that I'm going through at the time. And when that verse speaks to me, that's the verse I start memorizing. And I found that if I write it down many times, it helps. Now with this day and age with the iPhones or whatever, you can have it with you on your iPhone or your iPad while you're waiting in the doctor's office, while you're waiting to pick your kids up for school. Have that verse of just review it, review it, review it. You wouldn't know how many minutes you could use memorizing the word. I've had it when I'm putting on my makeup, when I'm combing my hair. I have that little slip of paper, or you could have a three by five card or your iPhone. Have it there and just take your time reading that word and not reading a magazine when you go into the doctor's office or something. Keep doing that. And one thing I want to tell you that was very helpful to me as I started reading and got a lot of scripture verses, I took a book and I divided it all up into the books of the Bible from Genesis through Revelation. And each time I memorized a verse, I put it you know, where it ever belonged. And so when I needed to get to it in a hurry, so many times you can't remember or the translations change. You notice I've memorized in the King James. It's hard to find that Schofield King James trans translation, but I have it right here. I'm gonna give it to my son. He's gonna inherit all this. <laughs> he's, gonna, he's gonna love the flowers on all those books. <laughs> That's great. All right, we just have time for one more, and um, it's enough, not to pick on you, Jamie, but it's another one for Jamie. So if a good friend keeps her mouth shut and doesn't gossip, aren't there times when I might need to get someone else involved? That is an excellent question, um, and unfortunately, 15 minutes goes by really quick when you're trying to cover this. Gossip is not a great thing, but there are times ladies, when I do think you need to get someone else involved. Um, and I'll think of just one or two examples, but if you feel like your friend is a harm to herself, if she's a harm to her children, if she is in danger, those are definitely times to get someone involved who can be helpful. Um, another thing that I can think of, and I know this to be true because um, my sweet sister did this for me, um, sometimes hormones can be unkind, right? And um, if you're struggling, your friend is struggling with depression, or like myself, it's postpartum depression, and you are not in a good spot, again, I think that's a great time to say, you need some help. <laughs> um, or you go to someone that you know your friend will trust and can be helpful. Um, a lot of times, I think this is a good time to get a more mature, godly woman involved. <laughs> um, there's also, <laughs> um, there's some fabulous pastor's wives, ladies, that are available to you. Um, I think that there are instances definitely when it is not the time to keep your mouth shut. Um, you have to use your discretion a little bit. Great. Well, let's thank them one more time. I know. Stay up here for a minute. Okay. Stay here for a minute. Okay. Um, I just have a quick couple of housekeeping things um, before you leave. The back page of your program has upcoming dates, and you will note. Thank you all for your plugs for women's Bible studies. We will be starting um, September 13th and 14th. So you'll see information about what we will be studying and registration in August, which isn't that far off. So I hope you'll join us. And there are other dates on there. Also, um, this Sunday night, we will be having a hymn sing, as I understand it, maybe an old-fashioned hymn sing, in the sanctuary led by Pastor Dan. Starts at 6 o'clock Sunday night. So you want to add that to that little calendar. And um, not all of you are going to be familiar with this book, but there is a wonderful book out there called The Insanity of God, written by a man named Cal Ripkin, and they have turned it into a movie. And there will be Nick, sorry, Nick, 
he was a baseball player. So <laughs> Nick Ripkin, and he, uh, it, there will be one showing at the Marcus Majestic on August 30th at 7 o'clock. There are no discount tickets available, but that's it. So I just wanted to let you know that that's going to be coming up. Um, and then there was a pair of glasses left in the bathroom. If anyone is missing them, we have them on the table over here by the kitchen. So if we could all, if we could have our lovely high school server girls, please stand up. We want to thank you. See, they're all these gals in training, aren't they? They're serving. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. All right, let's close in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for these precious women who have shared from their hearts. We thank you that you have been moving in their lives, and we thank you for their words and for their example. Lord, we want to be rooted like these. We want to live out your holy word. Help us to be godly women. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great evening. Thanks for coming. <laughs>